So the story starts with a Chinese philosopher, a Prussian general, an ostracized Air Force officer, and a U.S. Marine walking into a bar. What emerges is Marine Corps doctrinal publication one. The official manual of the title, Warfighting. In a nutshell, the Warfighting Manual lays out the Marine Corps method to dealing with chaos, how to overcome complexity, how to work with less than ideal resources in a tough situation. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like a lot of people's lives. So then, what is the Marine Corps method, and how can you get ahead of 99% of people? So the first step of the Marine Corps method is to identify the enemy. First up, we've got friction. Then you have uncertainty. Then you have fluidity. And finally, all three of those lead to to disorder. Now, friction is defined as the unexpected challenge. You had a plan for the day, except you woke up late or one of your kids was sick or something happened at work. All of a sudden, your boss assigned you a project you didn't expect. And all of a sudden, you're, yeah, your day is not going as planned. Next up, we've got uncertainty. And because of that friction, because of the assignment, because of the work now your boss gave you in the morning, you're not certain. Actually, are you going to be able to get home on time? You've got commitments there. All of a sudden, the future is, yeah, you're just not sure about it. Next up, we've got fluidity. And this is the constant change. Again, you had a plan. All of a sudden, it is now off the rails and everything is in flux. This is stressing you out. And disorder, pretty self-explanatory. You started the day with a plan. You had an idea of how things were going to go. Now you see complete chaos in your future. So the bad news here is this four-part enemy has been around forever. The good news? Well, there's a proven method to deal with it. Now, the classic Marine Corps method in the manual, Warfighting, emphasizes three things. Adaptability, initiative, and swift decision-making. Now, I'm taking a few liberties from my experience, and I want this to apply to the average guy out there, so I'm going to expand on this just a bit. Now, as many of you guys probably know, I served in the United States Marine Corps, but what you probably don't know is exactly what I did. I was an 0180, a staff officer with an infantry battalion. My job was to make sure that everyone had their paperwork lined up. Yeah, it sounds pretty boring, but it was pretty cool, and I think what was most rewarding is just making sure that my Marines were prepared for bad situations, because the reality is that bad things do happen, and you want to make sure that your family that those you love are taken care of and that you've got your life insurance lined up. That's why, gents, I'm proud to bring you today's sponsor, Fabric by Gerber Life. Fabric by Gerber Life was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. The reality is you don't know what the future holds, and you want to make sure that you've got your family protected. Now, gents, when you go over to the website, what you're going to see is that Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget. They've got quality policies like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. You also can get your personalized quote in just minutes. You can then apply it when it's convenient for you. It's all online, so it's all on your schedule. Seriously, gents, you could go from start to covered in less than 10 minutes and with no health exam required. Gents, there's no risk to apply. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee and you can cancel at any time. And by the way, Fabric is more than just life insurance. So their easy digital platform allows you to be able to create wills, access college savings funds, and manage your family's finances right from your phone so your family is prepared for anything. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash R-M-R-S. Gents, that link again is meetfabric.com slash R-M-R-S. And I'm putting that link in the description of today's video. You can click it and go right over. So step number one of the Marine Corps method is to sweat more in peacetime and bleed less in war. Anyone that's ever served in the military, anyone that's been an EMT, a firefighter, a police officer, you know what it is to train and train and train and train. And sometimes I, I've known guys that served for over 20 years in the military and they never saw combat. I mean, to get specific, in the Marine Corps, we had these cycles and they would culminate in what was known as a deployment. That would be for about six months, but you would spend 18 to 24 months preparing for this deployment, depending on what's going on in the Marine Corps. So every two years, you got people leaving, you got people coming in, but uh, they'd, be, they'd be doing their outdoor training. They'd be you know, doing bivouacs, you know, just going to 29 Palms. We were on the West Coast. And then six to eight months before we start to deploy, we get to start to know the other officers with the other units that are going to be attached. So we go from being just a regular battalion to a reinforced, basically a BLT, battalion landing team. And that battalion landing team has 
air units attached to us. Literally, we've got Harriers, we've got helicopters. Uh, all of a sudden, we had tanks. Again, date myself back 2003. You have all these different units, coming, engineers coming in, and they were reinforcing this already existing battalion. That battalion then has to work as one. Point being is we spent over two years preparing for something that in some cases never actually really happened. The idea of sweating more in peacetime, bleeding less in war, I think can apply to any person out there when it comes to being prepared. These are things that are within your control. Gentlemen, it's that type of mindset. It's being proactive, not reactive, knowing that statistically things are going to happen. And you going through your vehicle, making sure you got your first aid kit, you've got your emergency, you know, your blanket, you've got that charger so that you can restart your battery, which you know at some point it's going to die. So many things going through your house, making sure that, hey, have I made myself a hard target? Uh, is everything secured on my door? Going down and, you know, your furnace cleaning. I mean, again, there's so many things you could go through to be prepared for the eventualities we know are going to happen. Now let's talk about that expecting the bad. I'm not a pessimistic person. In fact, I think I'm pretty optimistic, but I am a realist. I know that if you're going to have an outdoor wedding, you're in Wisconsin, certain times of the year, yeah, you just need to have a backup plan. Point being is so many times in life, we don't have a backup plan. We don't, we think everything is going to be rosy. We think everything is going to go perfectly. And we're not planning for those statistically probable scenarios, which unfortunately could throw the whole thing off track. Now, von Clausewitz, and in his book On War, he talks about the fog of war. And the fog of war is during combat operations. A lot of things, just all of a sudden, you can't see anymore. You had great communications with your forward units. All of a sudden, they're cut off. So have they been destroyed? Are they just simply cut off? What is going on? All of a sudden, you're dealing with this anxiety. You're dealing with this uncertainty, these unknown factors. You're having to make decisions based off of limited information. And what he talks about here is the importance of remaining calm and understanding and being able to deal with the information as it comes to you. Now, maybe I shouldn't have said expecting things to go bad. I probably could have gone with planning for things to go bad. But the idea here is to have that backup plan. And to not be surprised whenever, you know, the odds do not go in your favor. The next part of my modified Marine Corps method, the plan is nothing, but planning is everything. The key point here is adaptability. And that is one of the tenets coming out of the manual war fighting is that in order to be able to overcome, in order to be able to deal with things, especially when you have limited resources and you need to move quick, you need to be able to adapt to the situation. A problem I see a lot of people fall into is that they fall in love with their plan, their plan for the day, for the afternoon, for the month, for their life. And when they get thrown off that plan, all of a sudden there is an insurmountable obstacle in the way they get paralyzed. They get frustrated. They keep hitting up against that rock, thinking somehow they're going to be able to smash through it when they just simply need to adapt. Now, that's easier said than done, especially if you're not used to adapting. But if you've had your plan torn up multiple times, in fact, I remember seeing in combat operations, our perfect plan had to get thrown out the window because we met resistance in an area we did not expect it. Well, guess what? Everyone had already gone through and we, we knew how to on the fly quickly adjust because we had practiced doing it. Now, how does being adaptable apply to you and how can you use it to get ahead? Well, the key to being adaptable is to understand what your end goal is, where you want to end up. You could always pivot and adjust if you can realign your azimuth with the end point that you want to reach. So in your situation, you're dealing with some friction at work. You've got a new boss and he's having to implement this CRM system. Let's just face it, is frustrating. You guys had a system that works. Why are they putting this new stuff down on you? You've got 10 years experience and you could use that to butt heads with this new guy that came in. Or you can look at, hey, what is the end goal? What do we want to achieve here? Well, your end goal is that you want to move up into a higher level of management. You want to get paid more money. And you realize that your new boss actually isn't your enemy. This guy actually you want to be a future peer and you realize that he's going to need help. You've got experience. You've got a leadership cred with the guys that are currently there in the office. And you know what? This new system, you can learn it pretty quick. And all of a sudden you can show leadership and you can put yourself in a position so that you can move up. You're able to pivot here because you understand your new boss isn't your enemy. In fact, you understand that you're all on the same side here. This, you want this company to do well. So by you adapting, you becoming one of the company experts on this new system, all of a sudden you've got a path forward 
towards your main goal, which is to move up. Next up, let's talk about being bold, aka asking for forgiveness, not permission. So there's a classic scene in the movie Heartbreak Ridge when Gunny Highway is being reprimanded by a major. Now, what makes this moment sweet is that he's interrupted by the commanding officer who flies in on a helicopter, hears the story, hears the major's logic, and relieves him on the spot. Now, this particular story is fictional, but in real life, I've seen this happen. Now, I'm not going to name the commanding officer, but you can do your research. You can find out who he was. But in my chain of command, we had our regimental commander relieved by Mattis and, and Mad Dog Mattis. He had a reputation. He was aggressive and he did not feel that the unit was moving fast enough. They were held at certain key points. Now, for an officer to be relieved in combat operations, especially at a high level, is pretty darn rare. But the reason it happened, and again, I'm just speculating here, is because he didn't keep up the tempo. You see, tempo is fast decision-making on the ground with the information you have available. Apparently, the units were not moving quick enough. They were being too safe. And again, it's debatable whether or not this was the right or wrong decision. But one thing I will say about the Marine Corps is that they want to go in and break things. They want to move quick. They do not want their officers holding back their men. Now, there's a fine line between being bold and being reckless. But the Marine method I'm talking about here trusts that those at the tip of the spear, those at the front of an organization are often armed with the best information to make the decision right there on the spot. Now, to be bold and not reckless, you've got to have the wisdom to be able to see when it's an opportunity and when it could be a trap. And you need to have the resources at your disposal to be able to move forward and take advantage of the opening of the opportunity that just happens to present itself. So an example of being bold in real life, I think, is actually spotting an up and coming industry, an up and coming company that you actually know could use your services and you reach out to them. Maybe you're working as a contractor. Maybe you actually go in and you're a full time employee, maybe not getting paid a whole lot, but you get a bit of stock, you get a bit of investment into that company so that you will be able to reap the rewards. Yes, it's a bit bold, but you've got insider information. You know this industry. You know in the next few years, this company has the chance to be something huge and you getting in on the ground floor, that is a bold move. So this next one, suffering is tolerable with the right company. Now, I'm not meaning to downplay anyone's pain and suffering, things that they've endured, the traumas they've gone through. But I am going to take a page out of Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. In that book, he talks about the importance of purpose. And as somebody that went through the Nazi death camps, he talks about how his purpose, the significance, the things that he wanted to accomplish, how it helped power him through that suffering. Now, one thing that seems to unite all Marines throughout history, doesn't matter what time or when you went through OCS or a boot camp, is the suffering of, yes, going through that initial training. And then you think it's all going to get better when you get out to the fleet and you realize it's just more of the same. But seriously, the fleet isn't that bad. After a few years, right, you get some seniority. I mean, philosophically speaking, suffering is a part of life. The Buddha talked about how suffering is a result of our attachment to things. So if it's a natural part of life, if you can't escape it, then what can you do? Well, you can adjust your attitude towards it. What the Marine Corps taught me about pain and suffering is that you are capable of a lot more than what you think. Now, the first step in this method, and it's pretty famous, is that they break you down. Basically, you get your head shaved. You have all your belongings taken away from you. You are basically a number. You're put into a squad bay with a lot of other people and you're yelled at. And anyone that's been through a boot camp, you know that this is a stressful, this is a tough situation. But if done correctly, what's cool about this is they start to build you back up. For us, it was little things like going on a three mile forced march with a rucksack, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you got 70 pounds on your back, you're carrying your weapon, it's, it's pretty tough. And then you go from three miles to five miles, to eight miles, to 12 miles, to 15 miles, to 20 miles. And that's just the physical stuff. Mentally, you're starting to pick up all the military protocols, the way to march correctly. And they start you with the basics, but step by step through a regimented program, all of a sudden you're being built up into in this case, a Marine. The suffering is also made tolerable because you've got people around you, not because you're hoping that they get yelled at, well, maybe sometimes, but uh, what you're really there is, it's like, wow, if these people can do it, I can do it. And it's really a powerful motivator when you don't feel like you can keep going or getting really tired and you look around and no one's fallen out. You don't want to be the guy that falls out of the march and gets the silver bullet. Now, how does this apply to you? 
Well, we live in a world that is making you soft. So you're going to have to push against this. You're going to have to purposely seek out challenge, suffering, a little bit of pain. That being said, disguise it as something fun. Maybe it's taking up jujitsu at your local gym, committing to your first marathon that you're going to run with one of your coworkers, or finally caving into your neighbor's invites to their CrossFit gym. The point here is you are voluntarily seeking discomfort. By doing this, you're increasing your pain tolerance and therefore changing your perspective on what suffering is. As you can imagine, this type of mindset can give you a huge leg up over your competition. All right, Jen, so what video to watch next? How about why are the Marines so stylish? You've ever wondered why are they just so damn good looking? Guys, I got you covered in this video. Boom, right here. I break out the uniform. I break out the stylistic details of the Marine Corps. Right there. Oh, yeah.